Welcome everyone. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy. And today we're going to explore your company's marketing strengths and weakness through something called the lead building system and your LBS score. This is a system uh, that we've developed uh, here at BizHack that we have worked with hundreds of business owners like you to help you guys evaluate your marketing and figure out uh, where your strengths are and, and where you need to do some work. So I wanted to invite you first to introduce yourselves in the chat. This is an interactive session. And so those of you who uh, do share in the chat are going to be much more likely to be um, get some one-on-one -on -one time with me during today's call and we'll workshop some of your challenges. Um, so please uh, introduce yourself, name, company, and let us know what is your biggest marketing challenge. So Chris Sneed, hey, great to see you, Chris. Uh, his toughest issue is determining which marketing methods work best and how to track them. Uh, that's a fantastic one. That's really a pillar one issue, Chris, and we're going to talk a lot about pillar one, campaign objective and, and KPIs. Uh, we have uh, Megan Murphy. Uh, great to see you, Megan, or uh, one of our newest uh, BizHack students. Um, consistently posting uh, is her biggest challenge. Um, so that's really about pillar five, which is about uh, uh, compelling content. Tim Farrell, uh, veterans for you, uh, fellow 10KSB alumnus, marketing to the federal government uh, is his challenge. Um, he has a very specific target audience and how does he uh, get noisy in front of them? That's a classic kind of B2B challenge. Um, and how to find them online. Uh, pillar two is target audience and how to find them online. We have uh, Millie Herrera. Uh, her business uh, is the Miami Group and Associates and her biggest marketing challenge is really um, kind of finding the time slash finding the right person to execute her marketing plan. Um, that one, Millie, is really about um, marketing strategy and, and having a really solid set of object objectives. Uh, so that's really a pillar one issue. Once you've defined those objectives, it'll be a lot clearer to you uh, whether this is something you can do yourself or if you need to hire someone to do it for you. And then, of course, if you do hire them to be really clear about what their goals are and what they're going to be doing for you. We have Jamie Spector from Miami Waterkeeper. Jamie, great to have you here. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, your biggest challenge is educating the public about issues while engaging them to take action at the same time. So that engaging them to take action is really about your call to action, right? Which is pillar six. Uh, we'll talk about that. Barbara Martinez, um, she is the, the head of a uh, environmental education nonprofit. Her challenge is reaching new audiences beyond her direct participants. Um, that issue there is, um, it didn't print, sweetie, sweetie I'm sorry. Um, her issue there is uh, all about um, reaching new audiences beyond their direct participants, selling to strangers. That's what this entire uh, session is about. It's a systematic process to selling to strangers online. So uh, this will definitely help you. Uh, hey, Vanessa from Career Exchange, good to see you. Um, we're uh, having challenges creating pinpointed content for our audience. We do have a regular lead flow, but we could be doing more. I'd also like to understand how to make the most of the leads. So. Creating pinpointed content for our audience uh, is really about compelling content, pillar five. How to make most of the leads is really about customer journey, pillar six. So we'll be talking about all of these issues. They all fit really snugly inside of our uh, marketing framework that we're gonna be showing you today. Um, for those of you who haven't yet, uh, this is how you chat. Uh, just click on the chat button and throw your stuff in there. Um, we also do have a Q&A function, but we don't need to worry about that so much today. If you have a question, I'd actually much rather you raise your hand. And the way you raise your hand is you click on the more button and raise your hand. Um, and so that, uh, that would be the easiest way to get my attention. This is intended to be interactive and, and to be useful specifically to your needs. So if you have any issues or you need any help, just raise your hand and let us know. Um, Daniel from uh, HR and Manpower Services is getting more leads on our prospects and getting them to engage with us. Um, that's really, uh, you know, lead generation is what the six pillars is all about. That's why we call it the lead building system, Daniel. Uh, and then getting them to engage with us is really uh, getting clear on what does engage mean. 
Um, and what is the steps in the journey once you've initially contacted them? So that's really a pillar six customer journey issue. Uh, a lot of you guys already know me. I see a lot of very uh, familiar, friendly faces here, but my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack, and I'm the creator uh, of the lead building system, which is what we're going to be covering today. I spent 15 years as a journalist at the highest levels of journalism, NPR, PBS, Washington Post, Miami Herald. It's part of a Pulitzer Prize there. I also was the news director at the NPR station in Miami. And then over the last 10 years, really pivoted to become a business storyteller uh, a growth marketer for a billion dollar company and a couple SaaS companies, and now uh, an entrepreneur and an educator with BizHack. And uh, I am a proud graduate uh, of Princeton University as an undergrad, got my master's degree at FIU in storytelling, and I actually went through the Goldman Sachs 10KSB program, and I see a number of fellow 10KSBers here uh, on the call. Great to have you guys here. I also had a Fulbright in Argentina. Um, BizHack has partnered with a lot uh, of top um, small business support organizations and universities. Uh, we are specifically dedicated to helping uh, minority and women-owned businesses, and we have scholarship programs for both, and we've been recognized with lots of awards and accolades for the work that we do with you guys. But the most gratifying thing that we do is we help companies uh, grow. Uh, a good example is a B2C company, Yoel Gutierrez of Mosquito Joe of Miami. It's a pest control franchise. Uh, our process, the lead building system, helped him reduce his cost per lead by 75% and 10x the number of leads he was generating. This uh, led him to become uh, one of the largest franchises for Mosquito Joe in the country, part of their million dollar club. Uh, and uh, he's really kind of become a leader, as Chris Sneed can tell you, um, among his peers in digital marketing uh, after taking our program. We also have uh, an amazing B2B uh, case study, Michelle Rupp of Energy Insurance. She sells business insurance. Uh, while in our class, she spent 190 bucks on ads and was able to close a deal with $6,500. That's a $39 uh, return on ad spend. And for her, like many folks, um, digital marketing has been just like a deep black hole. Uh, and now she has a game plan and feels confident. And, and the, the goal for today is to give you a game plan. Uh, to stop random acts of marketing, to make you have a systematic process for attracting strangers to your business, to attract and sell uh, folks you don't know and to widen your network. Spray and pray does not work. Throwing spaghetti against the wall is not systematic. Random acts of marketing, if you're lucky, will work once but not twice. And so what you need is a systematic approach and process, a proven process for digital marketing. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this proven process has, has shown results for the more than uh, 200 businesses that we trained in 2020. Their average return on ad spend was nearly $30, $29.87 for every $1 they spent in ads. So this is a proven process that works and has worked for many businesses uh, including some who are on the call today. So what are you up to today? Today, we're going to do a deep dive into the lead building system. Um, you're going to come away really understanding it. You're going to get your lead building system score to identify your marketing strengths and weaknesses. So you're going to do your own audit, your own self-assessment of where you're strong and weak. And then you're all invited to schedule a call with me if you want to workshop your marketing challenge. So if you like what you're hearing and you want to chat with uh, someone uh, about, about your marketing, about how to shore up your weaknesses. I'm offering free 20 minute consultations. Uh, Lilia is helping schedule those. I have time in my schedule blocked uh, all day Thursday and most of the day Friday uh, and would love to, guide, to get you in uh, and to follow up on the momentum we build in this uh, hour long session. Um, we're gonna invite you guys to be panelists when you guys have questions and when you do, um, if you can turn on your video, great, but just be ready. We're going to call on you. Um, we're going to call on you to um, share uh, because that's how we're going to learn. It's really a workshop session. So just be ready. We're going to promote you to a panelist and call on you to share. Um, I want you to open um, two documents, please. Um, and Lilia, if you could put uh, these back in the chat again, I shared them early on. Um, one is your lead building system score. Um, and the other is your lead building system checklist. 
Um, and this checklist, frankly, is really valuable uh, to you. Uh, and this is something you can print out, something you can have on your desk to refer to, something that you can give to your, your team. Uh, it's a reference that is our gift to you as a thank you for coming today. And uh, what we're gonna do really is we're gonna go through each of the seven elements of the lead building system and dive deep into each of them and have you guys share some case studies around each one of them so that you can actually um, begin to improve, to get a sense of where you're strong and weak and, and, and improve your marketing. So what is this lead building system? Well, uh, many of you um, have uh, really struggled with your small business marketing. You don't know uh, where to start, who to hire, how to measure success. And the reason why is not because you're, you're, you're daft, it's because digital marketing is complex. It's a very technical field. You can look here, this is a map of all of the areas, uh, all the disciplines within digital marketing produ produced by Gartner, the top think tank in digital marketing. And you can see that this thing is uh, challenging. There's a lot uh, to know, a lot of areas uh, to, ex to be expert in, and there's no real center to it. There, this isn't, in other words, Googleable. Uh, if you try to Google this or go, try to go to YouTube, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go down a rabbit hole of educational marketing of people who are trying to sell you their software solution or their agency services. And um, maybe you'll then go to Facebook or Google's ad academies. And that's really uh, the fox in the hen house. These are the guys who've made themselves into, uh, you know, trillion dollar companies by basically getting folks like you to spend money on advertising with them. And so um, to learn how to advertise from them uh, is always gonna have an inherent bias towards you spending more money on their platform. So we are an independent uh, educating uh, educator. We, we don't provide, uh, we're not an agency, you know, we're not using this as a, an upsell. All we really are selling is to upskill business owners and their teams so that you can take control of your marketing. That's really what we're all about. And we specialize in serving the hardest segment of the market, the small business owner, folks who are limited in time, money, and expertise, and what we've created is a simplified, proven process for finding customers online. Um, this process, the system has seven elements. It's the foundation and the six pillars. And then in our actual Digital Marketing Edge course, we then walk you through the nine steps of implementing them for your business. So what are the seven elements? So the, the, the foundation is your business story, your core purpose and your story of me. And then you have six campaign objective, uh, six uh, pillars, campaign objective, target audience, irresistible offer, thumb stopping video, compelling message, and call to action. And similar to a building, the lead building will crumble if any of the pillars are weak. And if there isn't a solid foundation, you can't even build a top of it. So the lead building is like a structure. And you, it, as a result, we do not take a strengths-based approach to marketing. We focus first on your weaknesses, the areas where you're weakest. Because like pillars for a house, a weak pillar will cause the building to collapse. So we need to shore up all six of these critical elements, these six pillars, in order for your lead building to be solid. That's the lead building system. And this is a system that we have developed over seven years with 700 businesses um, working side by side and hand in hand with businesses on the realities of their marketing. None of this is from an academic perspective. All of this is from the doing. And we borrowed some of the best practices from the best marketers in the world, IBM, best B2B marketer in the world, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Apple, Google. Um, and then we've applied this, Facebook, of course, we've applied those to small businesses like Raphael Savino at Ascend Dance Studios. Raphael uh, runs a small dance studio in Doral, Florida, near Miami. He came through our program a few years back. Uh, he's a smart guy. He had worked at Amazon before uh, he and his wife started their studio. Through, um, you know, we kind of kicked him off on a journey that has culminated in him being featured in a national ad campaign by Google Ads because of the excellence he's shown in running ads and also uh, on panels 
uh, in Facebook to help folks who are looking how to market their dance studios. He's really become a thought leader. He's also one of our certified instructors. It is possible uh, for you guys to starting from scratch, uh, build up and become an expert in this field because it's so new and there are so people in your, so few uh, business owners in your industry with an expertise in this, that pretty quickly within a few years, you can become top of the field uh, and we will help you get started in that journey. So let's start with uh, the foundation. And what I actually want you to do is I want you to make sure to open those links and you're gonna see two things, right? One is the lead building score checklist and put, go ahead and put your name, your email address, your company name. And then over the course of the next uh, 44 minutes, we're gonna be going over each of the elements, the seven elements, and you're gonna give yourself a score from zero to 10. And then at the end of this, you're going to add up that number and submit your LBS score. And then we'll share that score on the chat. So, so basically all of you should have this opened up and be following along with it, scoring yourself um, as we go. The second thing uh, that you're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, and I'm gonna just make this a little bigger, um, is we're gonna then go over the lead building score checklist. And, and this is gonna be really the core and foundational uh, element for today's presentation is we're gonna go step-by-step step through the elements in the checklist to make sure that you guys are clear on each of them. Um, and we're gonna start now with the foundation, your business story. So each of you are the CEOs of your business, chief energy officer. And as your energy ebbs and flows, so does the business. So your key role as the CEO, chief energy officer of your business is to maintain a high level of energy to inspire your staff and to serve your clients. And how do you do that when we're working so hard, when we're stressed out about payroll, when we're dealing with hiring issues, when we're struggling with um, supply chain issues, when we can't figure out how to sell to strangers online, how do we keep that level of energy? We tap into what's known as our source energy. And what is our source energy? It's what's known in business circles as your why. And this idea was really popularized by a leadership theorist named Simon Sinek. And he wrote a book called Start With Why. He did a TED Talk that's one of the top 10 most popular TED Talks in history. And he talked about the leadership principle of understanding why you do what you do and learning how to articulate that first before you talk about the what. This is a leadership principle. This is a principle that's really principally about how you lead an organization, how you motivate customers, uh, how you motivate employees and how you hire new employees. So it's really about leadership. But we've actually at BizHack feel like this is also the foundation, not just of leadership, but of your entire company, including your sales and your marketing. You attract investors through your why. So every key element of your business taps into this source energy, this personal reason that motivates you to do the work that you do, which we call your why. And in order to articulate your why, you have to come up with a story, an anecdote or several anecdotes from your life that exemplify your story of me, your, your personal story, your why your personal motivation for doing the work that you do. Let me give you an example. Amy Williams is one of our uh, clients. She went through uh, several of our programs and we worked on her uh, with her on her business story. And her business story was all about how she and her husband really wanted to start a business, kind of work for themselves, have a higher level of freedom, not have a boss. Um, it, was a, it was a typical entrepreneurial story. It was also not at all about the customer. And it was not really, uh, it didn't seem to capture who she was or how she was as a businesswoman. 
Anyone who's worked with Amy Williams for half a minute knows that she is unusually passionate and dedicated about helping people. And it turns out that her business, Promotional Products, is about helping B2B companies have better and more intimate relationships with their customers. You know, and she creates, you know, branded products like pens and mugs, uh, but it's about so much more to her clearly than just putting your logo on a cheap mug. It's really about helping people. So I asked a a uh, Amy, I'm like, Amy, uh, you know, I understand that you're, um, you started this business with your husband to create a life that you wanted to create a life by design, but there seems to be something more profound at work here. You're, you're kind of like a caretaker of your customers. You're, you're more than just, you know, uh, we're more than clients to you. And I can tell that. And, and, and it's interesting. She said, Dan, you know, it's amazing that you use the word caretaker because um, when I was four years old, my mother developed adult onset blindness and lost her ability to see. And as a four-year-old, I had to learn how to read and write so I could help her with just the household tasks. And when I was four years old, when she needed to sign a check, I would guide her hand. And when I was five years old, I just started signing the checks myself. And so my entire life, I've been a caretaker, first of my mom, now of my clients. And I said, that, that's your story of me. You know, forget talking about making your, you and your husband rich and having a nice life. Talk about your mom. Talk about care, taking care of her and how that's what you do for your clients. And I asked her, do you tell your clients this story? She's like, no. I said, do you tell your employees this story? She said, no. I said, do you tell your prospects that you're looking to hire this story? And she said, no. I said, you need to start telling this story to your vendors to your prospects, to your staff, and to your clients, and let them know that this is who you are and this is why you do what you do. That is your story of me. Now, once you've figured out your story of me, and your story of me, by the way, almost always dates back to your childhood. And this doesn't have to be a psychotherapy session. It's just like what, whatever comes to mind here that like really speaks to why you do what you do you know, your, your core values, uh, that's, that's the sort of thing you should be talking about more and getting in touch with more to help you get in touch with what we call your source energy. But that's not enough. It's not just why you do, but it's what you do. So it's not just the, uh, the, it's not just, uh, the, the what, it's, it's not just the why, it's also the what. The what really does matter. And the what is your core purpose. Your core purpose is the positive impact in the world because your business exists. So while her why is that she's a caretaker, Amy's what is that she helps businesses thrive by creating more intimate connections with their customers. So all of you need to, to understand both your why, your story of me, and your what, your core purpose, what work you do in the world for your customer. And it's all about them. You got to remember with marketing, it's all about your customers. And so understanding what your what is, is really understanding what is your unique value proposition and what pain point are you solving for them? What pains and gains do they have? To use the language of the, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the, uh, um, anyway, there's a mo model where you talk about uh, uh, pain relievers and, and, and gain producers, if anyone wants to remind me what it is, we can put it in the chat. Anyway, really, it's all about them. You don't want the story of me to distract from them, but they do need to know who you are because ultimately they're going to do business with you if they trust you and they believe you. Uh, and that's really what the foundation is all about. Um, we're going to talk about, when we get to pillar five, thought leadership focus. You can see I'm really passionate about this idea of your business story, about your why and your what. And that has become my thought leadership focus, which is pillar five, uh, which is your compelling content. Whatever lights you up is what you should be talking about on social media. It should be the focus of your personal brand and marketing. Your business might be talking about a wider range of things, but when it comes to you as a business owner, whatever makes you passionate 
is really uh, what you should be talking about online. And it'll make the chore of social media into a joy. Let's get into the six pillars. So now that you have that solid foundation of your why and your what, and you can discuss your, your core purpose and your story of me with clarity and concision, and you have a story ready to go for a sales prospect or an investor, now you need to actually figure out what your marketing strategy is going to be. And it always starts, it always starts, Chris Sneed, with your campaign objective. What are you trying to get done at a high level in your marketing and at a campaign level with an individual ad or an individual email or an individual video? Now, at the highest level, your campaign, your marketing objectives are going to be about acquiring new customers at a lower cost. That's known as the customer acquisition cost or the CAC, C-A-C. It's one of the most important metrics in all of marketing. And you need to understand your CAC or your customer acquisition cost by marketing channel. Let me break this down. All of us live in a multi-channel marketing world. A channel is just a, an avenue for advertising or marketing to your customers. Examples of channels are your website, landing pages, Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram posts, LinkedIn uh, posts, your LinkedIn profile, uh, email, of course, your um, you know Google ads, search engine optimization, blog, Yelp review, you, you know Yelp your Google My Business listing, like every business has multiple ways in which they are presenting themselves and reaching customers. The customer acquisition cost is how much money do you spend on that channel to acquire a new customer? So for instance, let's take your website. How many customers does your website generate for you through SEO, uh, you know, through search, through people filling out forms and scheduling a sales call? And then how much money do you spend creating blog content, hiring and working with an SEO firm, uh, driving traffic to the website? Uh, all of those then factor into the customer acquisition cost. So you take, and the easiest way to figure out what your customer acquisition cost is, look at what you're spending on a specific channel and then divide it by the number of customers that you get through that channel. For those of you who are not quite that sophisticated yet, just take your entire marketing budget, divide it by the number of new customers, and that's your customer acquisition cost, okay? So if I have a $20,000 marketing budget and I get uh, 20 customers a year through my marketing, I have a $1,000 customer acquisition cost, okay? The other big metric that you have to then figure out is what are those customers actually worth to you? And the customer's lifetime value is determined by which persona they have, which bucket they are in. So for instance, BizHack has primarily two types of clients. We have the participants in our training programs, and then we have our corporate clients who we do uh, a bigger set of business with. And the lifetime value of our training clients is usually a couple thousand bucks the lifetime value of our corporate clients is 20 to 30,000 bucks, right? So it differs. So the lifetime value is the amount of money that they will spend on you less the cost of goods and services over the course of their lifetime working with you. So for those of you who, who know a little bit about account accounting, it's your gross revenue less your COGS times the number of years that they're going to be doing business with you. So let's take a bread shop. And let's say you sell uh, $1, uh, $2 pieces of bread, but 50% of that cost uh, is going into making the bread and hiring the person who's baking the bread and the uh, actually you know, the hourly worker that's selling the bread and, and the 3% uh, credit card fee, right? So for every $2, $2 loaf, you make $1. And the average customer comes in five days a week to buy a loaf of bread. That's uh, $5 uh, dollars a week. Uh, and then they do it for 50 weeks. So that's $250 a year. And they do it uh, for 10 years. That's $2,500. So 
So $2,500 is what it is worth to you on average to get somebody to come in for the first time and buy a loaf of bread because they're going to eat the bread, they're going to love it, and they're going to come back for more. So $2,500 represents the break-even price for your customer acquisition cost, the break-even price for you to acquire that customer. So if I spend $2,500 to acquire that customer, I will take, it will take me 10 years, but I will make that money back $1 a day over the course of 10 years. Obviously, you want your customer acquisition cost to be way lower than your customer's lifetime value. So, but that every company determines that differently. So for a bread shop, you might say, you know, I want my customer acquisition cost to be one-tenth of their lifetime value. That would put you at 250 bucks. That would mean that it would take you a year of selling bread to that person to make up the cost of acquiring them as a customer. But you're planning on doing this business for a long time. So that's okay, right? You're in business for the long haul. And this is how marketers think about their campaign objective is they define their customer acquisition cost by channel. Um, they determine their customer's lifetime value by persona. And then they make sure that all of their marketing efforts are net cash flow positive, that the lifetime value is always larger than the customer acquisition cost. Let me give you one more really concrete example of how this works in real life. Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime lost money for years selling Amazon. Amazon lost money for years selling Amazon Prime. And the reason why is because they sold it at such a low price that they actually lost money every time they sold it. The only way they were able to do this is because they calculated that it was a very sticky product. It was going to have a very high lifetime value and that as they got more people and they were able to achieve economies of scale, what turned into a money losing proposition for them in year one and year two and year 10 would make them into the most profitable, one of the largest companies in the world by year 25. And that's exactly what they've done. And the playbook has worked to perfection. But if you look at the history of Amazon, Amazon Prime lost them money for years. And they funded it through investors and through the, the stock market because they had a, a, a vision for customers' lifetime value. And they figure once you're in, you're going to stick with us and get that recurring revenue going. And after 10 years, you will break, we will break even and now they're wildly profitable. It really does work, but it takes some intestinal fortitude, a little bit of upfront capital to fund the customer acquisition cost, and a long game mentality. The next pillar is target audience. Who is your ideal customer and how do you find them online? And one of the best things, guys, about being a business owner is you get to pick who your ideal customer is. I'd like all of you to just close your eyes right now and think of somebody who you do business with who is your ideal customer. And I want you to just put their name in the chat. I want this to be a real person. So what's an ideal customer? An ideal customer is someone who you love doing business with and who loves doing business with you. It's just a joy working with them. They need to be profitable, right? Because no matter how uh, awesome a human being they are, if you lose money doing business with them, they can't be your ideal customer. Your ideal customer should also be someone who is findable online. And they should ideally be someone where there are lots more of them where they came from. So I don't see anybody in the chat right now. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Chris. So Saul Glorioso uh, is Chris Sneed, uh, pest control company. Uh, Allison is Gasoline's. Keep going, guys. Throw in your ideal customer. I'd like to just give them uh, a little shout out uh, to this group of strangers. Tell us who your ideal customer is. Now, Chris and uh, Gasoline, um, please uh, share with us why those guys are your ideal customer. Um, we have... Uh, Casey Hart, Barbara, Amanda, Daniel Aisi, Darren. Uh, I'd like to hear from you guys, please. Jamie, Jose Casanova, Judy, 
Leticia, Marianne, Mike Vivaldi, Millie. I see all of you guys, Olga, uh, two Olgas, Gonzalez and Hasburn, Raymond, Sophia, Tim Farrell, Vanessa, Victor. Uh, if you engage at this point, it's much more likely that this will actually get you uh, lock in some of these ideas. So vision, who your ideal person is, your ideal customer. Uh, we have Marianne saying M. Harrison. Um, M Megan said that uh, the invisible customer since she cleans houses, I love that. Uh, Emily said the highly engaged board member. Uh, Millie Herrera says that Millie Herrera is her ideal customer. I think that's kind of funny. Uh, Anne, the parent of a student school. Uh, Tim says the marketing department in the military. So um, Olga said repeat customers. Uh, Olga said uh, a mole photography. So what, what you want to do is you want to identify your ideal customer. Um, and then you want to map out their persona. Um, and uh, Lilia, I don't know if you saw in the chat yesterday on Slack, but we found that really cool um, persona builder. Would you mind sharing that? in the chat. Uh, this is actually uh, done by a third party, but there's a way for you to actually uh, create um, a, uh, a persona. Um, let me see if I can, let me see if this is it. Yeah, so it's SEM rush uh, slash persona. Um, and this is absolutely the work uh, that you do uh, as a marketer is you, um, you fill out uh, all of these areas about that persona and, and you pick a, a picture of them to boot. Let me, um, let me see if there's a way for me to start over. Yeah, so you go here um, and then you get to pick, um, it's, they're not letting me do the, the, the first one, but uh, you get to pick what type of persona it is and then you fill out what are their frustrations, their motivations, a typical thing that they type, tend to say, what their company goals are, their demographic info, and so forth. And you really build out, even with a photograph, um, who that person is. Um, and I, they've done a beautiful job with this tool. You can then save and share it. Highly recommend it. It's a really cool tool, totally free to use. Uh, it's from SEM Rush, which is one of the best uh, you know, marketing uh, intelligence companies in the business. All right, so that's your audience persona. And, and the two key elements, the two key pillars for any business is understanding who, who is your target customer and then giving them an irresistible offer that's gonna make them want to do business with you. And I gotta say, most businesses are pretty clear on who their ideal customer are, especially if they've been in business for a while. You tend to figure this out by doing business. Your irresistible offer this is where businesses are weakest by and large. And by the way, guys, if you haven't been, I do want you to be going in to this lead building score survey and scoring yourself right now. Uh, we've talked about the business story. We've talked about the campaign objective. Do you know what your customer acquisition cost is? Do you know what your lifetime value is? If the answer is no, never thought about it, maybe put it down at a two. Uh, if you have a sense for that, maybe put it in a seven, eight, nine, or 10. Do you know your why and your core values and your core purpose? If yes, put that as, and you articulate that frequently, is it known by all, then that's a 10. For target audience, do you know with specificity who your target audience is and how to find them online? If that's yes, that's a 10. Do you know now what is your, pure, your irresistible offer? So I'd like all of you guys to go, kind of jump in there, take a second and give yourself scores uh, on these first uh, three elements. And now I'm gonna talk to you about what is your irresistible offer. So your irresistible offer is the thing of value that you provide to a prospective customer to make them want to raise their hand and say, I'm interested in learning more. That makes them want to give you their contact information and say, I want to schedule a time to chat with you. 99% of businesses, especially that we work with, have a sales process that's either in person or on the phone. And so the entire goal of your marketing is to get them to give you 
their email address and their phone number so you can schedule a chat, schedule a demo, schedule a site visit, schedule a meeting. So your marketing is all about what's called lead generation. And the way you generate leads is through an irresistible offer. An irresistible offer is something that you're giving away for free that someone would be willing to pay for. An example of an irresistible offer is this session right here. A free webinar with high quality content, a great group of people, and in exchange for you guys coming here today and getting these free gifts and getting this free education, you had to use your contact information to register. So that's an example of an irresistible offer. B2B companies, and I'm a B2B company, tend to use thought leadership and knowledge as their irresistible offer. So they'll give you white papers, you know, the seven tips for optimizing your website uh, or whatever it is, you know, seven tips for, for uh, uh, you know, picking a, uh, a person to clean your home, uh, you know, to clean your office. Uh, it could be, um, you know, a free assessment. Uh, you know, we'll do an audit uh, and, and let you know what's working and not working. All of those are examples of free irresistible offers in the B2B space. In the consumer space, it's dead simple, right? Like you see these offers all the time, buy one, get one free, 50% off your first purchase, refer, you know, refer a friend, that's like a referral offer, loyalty programs, you know, stars at Starbucks. All of those are uh, examples of motivators or offers that help get people to take the action you wanna take. Now, we don't talk about this uh, as much, but price is a form of offer. And the way you structure the price, like Amazon Prime, can motivate behaviors like annual subscription. So another way, uh, P, uh, the P in price is one of the pillars of traditional marketing as it's taught at most business schools. And price is an incredible psychological motivator as well. So think about your price as part of your offer as well. So the irresistible offer is essential and many, many businesses don't spend nearly enough time thinking about how are they going to do, what is their free irresistible offer to get a stranger to become a prospect? What is their foot in the door offer? What are they going to do to get their prospect to open their wallet and make a first sale? And then what is their upsell offer? How are they going to get somebody who makes a first purchase to make a second purchase, right? And a third purchase or to go from the basic plan to the upgraded plan. That's what you guys need to be thinking about in terms of your offer strategy. So now go into here. And if you've never thought about this, put a zero. If you've nailed this and you have a very clear offer strategy, put a 10 and somewhere in between. Now the next two uh, thumb stopping visual and compelling message are essential to any marketing campaign. So whenever you have a marketing campaign, your marketing campaign needs to have fabulous visuals, starting with a great video and a very compelling message. And that message and that uh, video are going to be what stops people when they're scrolling uh, on Facebook or in their newsfeed or uh, in, on, uh, you know, when they're looking at uh, different content uh, on a search uh, or, or in a YouTube feed. So thumb stopping simply means that when they scroll through, it causes them, the content is so arresting that they stop and look. And the best way to do that is with highly attractive visuals and specifically with video. Video, on Facebook at least, can reach 10 times the number of eyeballs for every dollar in advertising spent. So the reach is 10 times larger for a, a video ad than a static image ad. In other words, if you create a video ad, you're gonna get 10 times the money's worth than if you create a static image ad. That is why when we teach Facebook and Instagram advertising, we do not allow people to advertise with static images. The only exception that we found to this is uh, if you're a product company and you use a carousel ad with multiple pictures of products, those can be very effective as well. Why does Facebook and Google and YouTube and all of them preference video? The simple reason is because that's what users prefer. Video is the, um, is the language of the internet. Video is the way people communicate. 
in the 21st century, not words. And anyone who has a kid knows that people nowadays uh, that are coming up communicate not through text, more through language, uh, through, through video. And so having video uh, is essential. Video is also expensive and time consuming to make, right? Not so much. There have been some really cool tools that have been built, including ones that are inside of Facebook and Google ads that allow you to build a video slide, a, a photo slideshow with text in, in a matter of minutes. Um, we teach folks in our program to build a video in under an hour. So yes, video can be very time consuming and expensive to build, but it does not have to be. And for us small business owners who are constrained in time, money and expertise, better to use tools like Lumen5 or the Facebook video create, creation kit and build videos just using a couple of still images. And those still images can just be stock photos. But you got to make videos, guys, if you're going to want to advertise online. And those of you who have websites that don't have like a 90 second commercial about your company, you're missing out on a huge uh, opportunity to tell people about who you are and why you do what you do. But video is not enough. You need text to accompany it. And that text has to be compelling. And obviously, you know, you want to tell your story of me, but more importantly, you want to talk about your core purpose, why you do what you do. And that's where the notion of your thought leadership focus becomes so important. Us as business owners are thought leaders in our industry, in our field, and we want to be out there on social media, in front of our customers, in front of clients, on webinars, talking about the things that drove us to build our business, that are the core purpose behind our business, and that wake us up and, and light us up every day. And that's what we recommend on your, uh, around messaging. We want that messaging to be ATV, authentic, transparent, and yes, vulnerable. So if you're talking about your passion, you should also be talking about your failures and your learning journey. Why? Because in today's social media, you know, disintermediated world where media companies aren't trusted and editors aren't trusted and filters aren't trusted, we want an unvarnished, unfiltered view into who you are and what you do. And nobody is infallible. Nobody doesn't make mistakes. Nobody doesn't have a track record littered with failure, especially if you're an entrepreneur. We are the folks who fail more often than we succeed. What makes us different is we tap into that source energy, we get up and we try again. We are resilient and folks love that. We are the underdogs and that's the underdog story. So tell that story authentically, transparently and vulnerably. That's your compelling message. And go out there and plant a flag in favor of something. Does this thing have to be what your business sells? Not really, but it does need to speak to the audience you sell to. Let me give you a couple of examples. One of our clients, Michelle Rupp, sells, light, sells insurance for business. And look, insurance is terribly boring. Like it's, it's like talking about, you know, eating your peas. Uh, it's, it's necessary, right? It's meaningful work. Every business needs it. And nobody wants to hear you spouting off about the importance of insurance. It's dead, deadening. So Michelle said, you know what I'm really passionate about, Dan? I have run a remote workplace for an all-female company now for 15 years. And we built this remote workplace to accommodate the mothers on our workforce. And they have been incredibly effective despite working from home, and it's allowed them to comfortably raise a family. And I'm a passionate believer in the need for remote work. And this is 10 years before COVID. And I know how to do it. And I want to get out there and tell people and share my expertise. Bravo, Michelle. That's fabulous. She loves this. She's passionate about it. She has a real mission behind it. And guess what? The consumers of her thought leadership content about remote work are business owners. And what do business owners need? They need insurance. So she identified her target persona. She identified her core value. She used what we call the hedgehog principle from Jim Collins, or what the Japanese call ikigai. And she found the intersection of what she loved, what she's expert at, and what the world needs. What she loves, 
what she's expert at, and what the world needs. That's your thought leadership focus. That's your content strategy. That's your compelling message. So if you're not sure what to talk about, don't look out, look in and ask yourself, what would I love to talk to more people about? And now finally, we're going to go full circle back. Remember we started with your campaign objective? Notice that the campaign objective circles back to your call to action. Your call to action is what are you going to ask the person you're marketing to to do in order to kick them to the next stage in their customer journey? So for instance, let's say you have a campaign that's a Facebook ad. Your campaign objective is to get people to click on the ad and go to your website landing page to fill out a form. So your call to action is learn more or click now. It's click this button. The call to action then kicks them to your next campaign, which is a landing page with a form. And that landing page has to have great compelling message. It has to have a clear call to action. But in this case, the call to action is fill out the form submit the form. And then once they submitted the form, now you have their email address and then you send them an email. And that email might be book a call, right? So the call to action on the next stage of the customer journey is book a call. And then they book a call and then you send them a transactional email, which is confirm your appointment, right? So each of the stages, each of these touch points need to be mapped out. And that we call the customer journey map. And that is the essence of pillar six. So pillar six at the company level is that for every persona, for every campaign, you wanna have a customer journey mapped out that starts from initial touch to closing the sale. And it has often many, many, many steps in between. In fact, the average customer journey for a client B2B or B2C is between seven and 18. Seven to 18 touch points on average for a customer, for a prospect to become a customer. The other thing is that most salespeople quit after three touches. So you need 18 touches to close a B2B client and most B2B salespeople quit at three. What that means is it's not that you have too few leads, it's that you're giving up too early. And like all of us, we're in this for the long game, right? Just like we talked about the long game with customers' lifetime value, the sales and marketing process is a long game as well. And for an average B2B company, this can be a 12 to 18 month process. It could start, for us, it could start with a webinar like this. You might learn about us, you might like what you see. Then you might go to our masterclass webinar series, then you might sign up for one of our boot camps. Then you might sign up for our, our, our seven week program. Then you might join uh, as one of our corporates and we could really dig into your marketing. So that journey that I just described with multiple touch points, with you attending multiple events, it could take multiple years and that's okay. Like we are here to serve you and we're gonna work with you and be ready for you when you're ready to be, uh, do business with us. The key, therefore, to my marketing is just to get noisy and to be out there and to be doing stuff all the time so you don't forget about us and so that you associate BizHack and Dan Gretsch with digital marketing so that whenever you're like, God, I have a digital marketing question, that guy, Dan, he seemed to know what he was talking about. He seemed like a pretty nice guy. He seemed to be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable. I'll go reach out to him and just ask him and let's see if he doesn't try to sell me too hard. And I'll, call, I'll talk to you, uh, like I'll talk to many of you on our 20-minute calls. And my genuine desire and hope is to help you. So Victor, I do see your question. We're gonna wrap up here in a second and enter into a QA. and a but that is the call to action. And Lily, you can go ahead and um, promote Victor to one of the attendees, uh, to one of the panelists so that I can hear his question. So, so the customer journey and the call to action is what loops you back into the next campaign. And then you set the campaign objective for that next phase. In the example I gave, a Facebook ad, the campaign objective is link clicks. You, they click the link, then you have a landing page. And the campaign objective for the landing page is form fills. 
and then they fill out the form and the and the next uh, step in the customer journey is an email sequence. And the goal there is open rate or click through rate. And then finally, you're going to try to drive them into a sales call. So your campaign objective there is how many people book a sales call, how many people attend the sales call, and then how many people close and become a customer. That's a, cust that's a very typical customer journey. So thank you guys for taking the time to hang out with me. And I'm going to open it up to questions, starting with Victor. If anybody else has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Hey, Victor. Um, Tim Farrell, uh, go ahead and ask your question while we wait for Victor. <clears throat> Great, Dan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Good to be talking to you. Can get, uh, that, those slides you had, is there any way we can get copies of those slides? So we're not giving out copies of the slides, but honestly, like there's just not that much there. But what we are giving is this lead building system checklist. And you know what? Let me do one other thing. Uh, we have an ebook uh, that kind of lays this all out. Um, Lilia, is that ebook included in our follow up email? Yes, we're going to include it. Yeah. So this is a, a 17 page ebook that gives you everything and a lot more. Wow. Can't beat that. Thanks, Dan. It's been, ve it's been very helpful. And I do hey. plan on using your service here eventually. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. And, you know, let's talk a little bit more. Like you have a B2G business. That's a tough one, right? Because yeah. you know exactly who your target customers are, but they're not necessarily that active on social media. So like, what do you do? You know, one so, of the things I thought about, Dan, was uh, uh, getting mailing lists. So the, when there's conferences where there's a lot of government people buy the mailing list and reach out that way, what do you think? I think that's a great idea. Like, I think, you know, and, and by the way, let me just show you, share my screen real quick. So this is the the ebook, um, really, it's, uh, it's 17 pages. It's got a ton of great material in it. It has everything we talked about. It gives you case studies. It gives you, um, you know, information about each of the pillars. It's a great reference. So that, uh, in addition to this, is our kind of thank you gift for, this is kind of like the crib sheet that accompanies it. No, I appreciate that, Dan. And I, I plan to spread the word about your company. Oh, man, I really, well, thank you for your service as well. I know you have a, uh, a vet, you're a veteran and, and I, we really appreciate you and everything you've done for our, our country as well. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. So Victor, uh, Victor Appia, did you have a question? Anybody else, guys? We do have a few more minutes if you want to raise your hand. Um, Gazleen, I, I know we missed uh, our call last week. I apologize about that. Did you want to ask a question? Feel free to, to jump in and, and uh, ask a question now if you have anything we can help with. Um, I just noticed that, you know, for me and the pandemic and the way it has been, if it wasn't for the pandemic that took place, I would really be lost and behind with my business. And it's like the more I get involved with going into Zoom meetings, the more I'm understanding where my business is lacking. And now that I'm involved with you guys, it's like, I'm seeing so much. I even have to invest in a business coach to help understand how to promote. And it's like, I'm still not there because it's just me. Yes, my sister um, does uh, spa. However, um, we're two different people. So I'm trying to better myself and the business as well as her learning how to um, proper deliver. And when you mentioned about videos, I'm now seeing that video is very important, but it's like the pitch. How do you properly pitch yourself and how do you properly engage or ask the right questions to get people involved? Yeah, um, no, it's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll answer that in a sec. Just a quick reminder, I forgot to tell you guys, please submit your LBS score. And if you have a second, share with us Go ahead and add it up and then share with us in the chat what your score was. So um, uh, I'm going to actually, for those of you who are still here, I'm going to take a second now and I'm going to actually show you uh, what the average scores have been uh, for business owners like you. Uh, I'm not going to show any personal information, um, but you can see right here that uh, going down um, this, the foundation, uh, your business story, business owners actually are pretty good at this. Uh, a lot of you have ranked yourself eight or above. Campaign objective, analytics, and KPIs, not so good. A lot of you don't even give yourself a one on it. 
Um, target audience, business owners tend to be very good at this and you can see a clustering in a higher place. Whereas irresistible offer, gosh, I never even thought about that. You can see everybody's all over the map. Thumb stopping visual, Gasline, you're not alone. Uh, this is probably the areas of most profound weakness, business owners. They really struggle with video. Um, compelling message, you're a little better at. Um, and then calls to action. Most of us have learned that you need to ask your customer to take an action uh, in order for your marketing to be effective. Uh, just like I'm asking you guys to set up a call with me. And then where did the LBS score uh, work uh, out? The average LBS score that we've seen among the 30 or so respondents that we've gotten so far, uh, so far is in the mid 30s. So if you want to benchmark yourself against the average small business, if you're above the mid 30s, you're doing pretty well. If you're below the mid 30s, you definitely have something to attend to. But honestly, you know, a really kind of fully operational, high quality marketing department would be above 60. Uh, 60 is really kind of the threshold of excellence. Uh, these are these are really marketing basics, and any company with a sophisticated marketing uh, that's of a certain size would have a 60 or above. Um, we also have, um, I see, uh, Jamie, I'm going to invite you to speak, your hands raised. Uh, Jamie, what's, what do you have on mind? Uh, well, first, thank you so much for sharing those metrics, because it makes me feel a little bit better about my 38. Um, but also, a lot of that was for the for-profit world with customers buying something, a service, an item. In the nonprofit world, if you can look at it with donations, but then also thinking about engagement. Um, for example, with Miami Waterkeeper, a lot of the action items are contact your elected officials. So fill out this form and here's you know, pre-populated text. Um, all you have to do is put in your name and address so we make it very easy. Um, but quantifying the value of that, is that something that you've worked with before? Um, talking about like the engagement and the non-monetary value. Yeah. So are you aware that tomorrow, I am actually, one of my deep expertise is nonprofit marketing and that on mm -hmm. Thursday at 10 a.m. I'm doing a webinar on that topic. Um, um, may, yeah, maybe you could join yeah. us. I think I actually have that on my calendar. I did not know it was on that topic specifically. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's in co collaboration uh, with mm -hmm. uh, the Miami Foundation and mm -hmm. uh, Forgive Miami Day. Um, awesome. And it's uh, five reasons your nonprofit should start advertising online. We believe that the best practices of marketing for for-profits and nonprofits should be identical. The main difference between nonprofits is you actually have a bigger marketing challenge. And that's because your funder your, is not often, not always the same person as who's your user, mm -hmm. right? So in businesses, you know, you buy a, an iPad and you use it, right? You benefit from it directly. Whereas in um, nonprofits, you know, your donors and your funders um, measure the value of their investment in a different way. So right. the, the, the simple and short answer to your question is really about pillar one campaign objective. Like what is the objective and make sure that the objective is measurable and make sure that the objective matters to your funder. So for instance, uh, you know, number of people that like or share a post, not that meaningful. Number of people that uh, send a letter to their congressman, meaningful. Number of people that show up for a beach cleanup, even more meaningful. So mm -hmm. those metrics are marketing metrics, right? How many people did your campaign drive to show up somewhere? That's, that's a classic. So I don't think it's quite as um, different as you might think. And uh, we'll be actually really explicit about how to translate this system in the uh, nonprofit realm on Thursday morning. I hope to see you there. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, I know we're running a few minutes long. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for submitting your lead building system score. And uh, we do have a couple courses coming up. Uh, one starts on Monday. So I, I hope that we do have a chance to chat and, and uh, see if it might be a fit for you. And uh, we also offer private coaching uh, on the lead building system. And we can talk about that in our one-on-one -on -one as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it.